didn't say it. I thought, yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Wayne Benzel, and I have the privilege of being president and CEO here at the Nacogdoches County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I am uh, as interested in hearing this program as I suspect everybody in this room is today, where the landscape has changed as it relates to the regulations about, about concealed carry and uh, all of the uh, different elements of those. Uh, I'm anxious to hear our featured speaker this morning, Lieutenant Bill Kennedy. Uh, I want to let you know these programs are a joint venture between us and the Nacogdoches Economic Corporation, Development Corporation. Um, and uh, we try to, we, the two organizations try to put together something that one is topical and two is, uh, will help us navigate the uh, regulatory and legislative environment more successfully, especially as it relates to firearms. So with that, I'm going to take a moment and introduce my uh, esteemed colleague from NEDCO. Uh, she is Mary Frances Bradford. I have worked with Mary Frances for six years now, and it's, every day is a joy to have her around. Uh, she very capably represents the economic development community here in NEDCO. Good morning, Mary Frances. Good morning, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We're so glad that you all took time out of your busy day to come and participate in our business seminar. I'm honored to be able to introduce Lieutenant Bill Kennedy. Uh, he is one of those who got to Texas as soon as he could. He was born in Emmitsville, Iowa, and came to Nacogdoches with the Kennedy family in 1984. He graduated from Martinsville High School in 1996 and immediately began his law enforcement career with the Nacogdoches County Sheriff's Department. He stayed with them until 1999 when he joined the Nacogdoches Police Department. In his tenure at the Police Department, and he has a very distinguished career with them, he has served as the Patrol Division, Special Operations, Criminal Investigations, the Police Honor Guard, field training officer, SWAT team member, SWAT team leader, narcotics officer, gang officer, sergeant, and now lieutenant. <clears throat> he is currently assigned as the criminal investigations lieutenant, director of professional standards and SWAT team commander. commander. He is the master peace officer, certified shooting reconstructionist, longtime firearms tactics and hand combat instructor, and just completed his fifth term on the Texas Commission on Law Enforcement Legislature Update Committee. That is a long name for a committee. <laughs> he is an active member of Sacred Heart Catholic Church, a member of the Knights of Columbus, and the East Texas Chief Club. He's the proud son of the Honorable Sue Kennedy, retired, and Deacon William Kennedy, third deceased, and the lucky husband of Amanda Kennedy, and father to Allie Fuller and William Kennedy the fifth. So please help me welcome our speaker today, Lieutenant Bill Kennedy. At some point, we're going to be joined by Nagos District Attorney Andrew Jones for more of a legal opinion on some of this because I'm obviously not an attorney. Um, I'm going to talk to you kind of from a couple of different perspectives here, one from the law enforcement perspective and the other from what I do with the legislation. So every two years, obviously, we have new legislation. I'm one of 10 to 12 people in the state whose job it is to digest that legislation and make it understandable for peace officers write the curriculum that they have to take every two years. So I have a unique perspective in that I'm involved in the legislation kind of from the onset, and I can hopefully convey to you kind of how we look at it, what the legislation in Austin is trying to do with the bill, uh, and what ends up happening when that bill comes out. I do have a PowerPoint presentation. It will not hurt my feelings if we don't get through it because it's much more important to me that we're able to have the conversations and answer the questions that you have than it is for me to stand up here and lecture about some information that I'm not sure if you care about. And I only say that because particularly when it comes to the gun laws in Texas, they're incredibly complex. They're scattered over dozens of codes throughout all of the criminal codes in the state. Uh, it's not as simple as if you were a citizen and wanted to walk in the police department and say, hey, I, I've just moved to Texas. I want to know what I can do and what I can't do as far as carrying a gun. It would take us hours to have that conversation. That's how complex our laws are. I even brought the books with me just in case we run into a question that I can't remember because they are so complex. Uh, the chapter that governs most of our gun laws is chapter 49 of the Texas Penal Code, but within that code itself, there's multiple prohibited conducts. 
It's also the only code that at the end of that has a whole chapter called non-applicability. So it has a whole chapter dedicated to all of the circumstances where all the stuff you just learned in all these other statutes doesn't apply. <laughs> so it's, it's very, very, very complex. So I'm going to try to give you that legislative perspective so you understand what the legislator is trying to give us through the messaging. Because once the law is written, if you've ever read law, it doesn't matter whether it's criminal law or civil law or whatever, you've got to read it like 10 times just to figure out kind of the idea. Not, not down in the weeds of the actual law, just the idea because the way our laws are written. So I'm going to try to give you that legislative perspective, uh, give you the local perspective. Uh, again, you're going to get a mix of both the Nacogdoches Police Department's opinion on this and then kind of Bill Kennedy's opinion on this based on my 23 years of living in this community. Don't hesitate to ask a question. Uh, don't wait for me to pause or throw a hand up. If you have a question, just shout it out. We're just having a conversation here. I really would rather do that than lecture. So with that being said, we're going to dive in, uh, and at the end, I'm going to have some questions for you all because you're going to have very unique perspectives that I want to draw some information from. Uh, at the end of the day, my business cards up here, feel free to take one. It has my actual real cell phone number on it, so you can reach me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, you can please do or don't, not three o'clock in the morning. Just please don't hesitate to ask questions. I can't impress that enough. So we're going to start with, and please recognize this is a ridiculously oversimplification of what these laws are. They're just that complex. So we're going to start by talking about the actual bill that brought this conversation out. This is the uh, Firearms Carry Act of 2021. It's House Bill 1927. And if anybody wants any of this reference material, if you want the actual text of the bill, mm -hmm. get my email address. I will send it to you. If you want this PowerPoint presentation, I'll be glad to send that to you. Stay in contact with me if you have questions about this stuff or anything else related to law enforcement, really. I'll be glad to help you. So if, when we get a new bill, Usually at the top of that bill, there's a statement by the legislature. That introductory statement is really kind of a, a snapshot or a look, a lens into what their intent was in passing that piece of legislation. So what I brought in here is the stuff that came out of the top of this bill. So in House Bill 1927, the introductory statement is this. It's the legislature of the state of Texas finds that the Second Amendment of the United States Constitution protects the individual right to keep and bear arms and to possess a firearm unconnected with service in a militia and to use that firearm for traditionally lawful purposes, such as defense within the home. And then it says it secures for Texas citizens the right to keep and bear arms. Persons who are currently prohibited from possessing firearms under state and federal law will not gain the right to possess or carry firearms under this legislation. Now, I brought that in there because when we look at it and we analyze it, we go, okay, how do we implement this law? One of the biggest questions we have is, well, what was the legislature trying to accomplish? This is kind of where they tell us that. And this didn't just come about overnight. So over the last 10 years in my involvement in this, we saw this coming. And that's kind of how Texas legislature usually does things, is they kind of crawl, walk, run into a big change. They don't just overnight change some massive thing within Texas. So as we watched the legislation change from the traditional concealed carry laws that we had originally, before that, the no concealed carry laws, when I started, it was just the standard UCW laws. Then we got concealed carry. Then we got open carry. Now we have constitutional carry. All of those were precursors to this. And it was pretty much the intent. We could see that coming. Everybody in the legislative process knew that was going to happen. And really, what they're trying to tell us, and this is what I try to communicate to officers when they take these courses, is that the Texas legislature, our government in Texas, wants law-abiding citizens to be able to carry guns. That's really the overarching message that's coming out of the legislature for the past 10 years. So when it comes time for an officer to have an encounter with someone who's armed, I tell them that that's the foundation that they should make their decisions on, is that if the Texas legislature were standing there to try to help you make a decision how to deal with this conduct, the foundation of that decision is if they're a law-abiding citizen, the state of Texas legislature wants them to be able to carry. So as we work our way through the weeds of these prohibited conduct, what is and isn't, it's always based off that foundational idea. And Ideally, in a perfect world, law enforcement doesn't enforce laws based on their own opinion and perspective. They enforce it based on the fact that they're the executive branch of the government who's designed to enforce the laws passed by the legislature. There's always going to be some, some cross-pollination there that we use under our discretion, uh, but we need to try to communicate those foundational ideas. We don't want to run foul of the legislative body. So we're going to get into a little bit of the substance in just a second, but I wanted to give you some other insights. Again, this presentation is a very brief snapshot of our gun laws. Uh, they're overly complicated and they're very difficult to enforce. And this, the TDCAA is the Texas District and County Attorneys Association. 
So that's the association, association that all your prosecutors belong to, and that's where we get all of our books, where we go and reference the laws. That's also the group that we work with to come up with all of this material. This is a direct quote out of their interpretation of House Bill 1927. Well, if we didn't know any better, we think that perhaps the legislators are trying to make the weapons laws so complicated and confusing they cannot be enforced at all. They put that in their publication that went out to every lawyer and every police officer in the state of Texas. So it's not like they're hiding this opinion. This is legitimately how they feel. And sometimes that is a legislative methodology to get things done or not get things done, is make the laws so complex that they're almost enforced. Because the state of Texas isn't going to come out and just flat out say, we're repealing all gun laws. But they can make it very difficult to enforce them. And we'll get into a little bit of the weeds of that. Uh, again, this is not intended as legal advice, I'm not an attorney. Uh, and all of our encounter circumstances will be different and extremely fact specific. So I can give you some blanket ideas, and that's what we're going to talk about today. But your exact encounter, if you ever have one, maybe it's going to be very specific as to what we can and cannot do, what you can and cannot do as a business owner uh, as it relates to these gun laws. If you have any legal questions, Andrew Jones just walked in the back door. So, <laughs> no, he's actually he's very good at helping with these things. Uh, we work well together. So, again, just to reiterate what we talked about, as a general rule, uh, the legislature wants law-abiding citizens to be allowed to carry guns without government interference. That's kind of the overarching message from the Texas legislature. So, as we talk about all of these things, and you have questions, please bring them up. But remember, that's what the Texas legislature wants as we work through these issues. So generally in Texas, the regulation of firearms is divided into two prohibitions, two categories of prohibitions, either person-based, so what kind of person are we dealing with, and then location-based. So talking about person-based, you have certain special classes. So certain people that are allowed to do more than just the average citizen. A peace officer is a good example of that. The laws give us a certain authority for carrying a weapon that it does not give the general citizen. There are other people that fit within that same category. <laughs> Magistrates, armed security, and such and such. So they've gone through specialized training, they've, they've obtained a specialized licensure that allows them to do a little more. And really what it comes down to is mostly where they can carry, as opposed to where other people cannot. And there are still places in Texas that even me as a certified peace officer, I can't carry. Any kind of federal courthouse or anything like that, inside the secure facility or detention facility, prisoner jail, I can't carry in those places outside of very special circumstances. Uh, license to carry. So in Texas, we do, we do still have the license to carry, both the open and concealed carries. And they have, there are some places they can go that a normal citizen can't, even under the constitutional carry. So they even extend a little bit more authority or freedom to someone who has a license to carry as opposed to someone who does not. And then you have the new one. So under the new law, again, following that ideology that the state wants people who are not criminals to be able to carry guns, Anyone over the 21 year old now has the ability to carry a gun with some regulation. But as a general rule, 21 and old can carry a gun. And then you have prohibited persons. So in this order, you kind of see the greatest freedom to carry and diminishing freedom to carry as you go toward the bottom. So under certain circumstances, people become prohibited from carrying in certain places or at all. Uh, and we'll get into that those weeds a little bit, but I want to give you kind of a snapshot of how the state decides how much freedom a person has to carry based on that person. Because then we get into where they're carried. So as a general rule, the state and the federal government both look at it like this. Your home is your castle, so you have the greatest freedoms on property that you own. And then as you move away from that property, those freedoms diminish. The, a lot of those freedoms are extended to your vehicle because in most of the Fourth Amendment law, the stuff that governs your right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, the freedoms that you experience within your home are generally the same freedoms that you experience within your car. So the, the federal government and state government both say that that freedom extends to you as you travel in your own vehicle, even though you're on public roadways. And not to get into the, the real weeds of that, but the expectation of privacy diminishes as you leave your home. So it drops a little bit when you get in your car. When that car goes out to the public, it drops a little bit more. When you leave that car, it drops in your vehicle. So that's kind of how these laws work as well. And then you have prohibited locations. So there are certain places that are always prohibited, and then there are other locations that are prohibited under certain circumstances. For the most part, what we're going to talk about today is how this affects private business, because how it affects government is completely different. As an example, under the new constitutional carry, uh, government-owned buildings are generally prohibited from prohibiting carry. 
So you can walk in the lobby of the police department with a gun on your hip and there's nothing we can do about it. Because the state looks at it like that government is owned by, that building is owned by the government. The government is the people. So the government can't restrict the right of people who technically own that building to walk into it. Now we do have the ability to secure the secure areas where we don't allow public to just normally come and go. We have regulations there. But as an interesting sidebar, if you want to walk into the secure area of the police department and we want to choose to prohibit you from carrying in there, we have to provide you with gun lock. So now, like we have when we go in the back door of the jail, take him in the prison, we have to secure our gun and take a key. We can we have to provide that in our lobbies if we want to prohibit people from carrying in the secure areas. So we're going to get into the some of these a little more specifically. Again, you're already starting to see how complex this can get based on all of these combination of factors. So and the, as we get specific questions, I'll try to address them more specifically, but I just cannot get into the absolute weeds of what is this doing in Texas. And that's a sad state. I should be able to stand right here and tell you what you can do and what you can't do with a gun in Texas. I just can't. It's just too much information. So as a general rule, we're talking about these prohibited people. Let's talk about carrying in public. So if you're following that ideology that your house is the most free, your car is secondary, we're talking about what happens outside the car. Not inside your car, not inside your home or business, just out in the general public. So any person under the age of 21 cannot carry in general public. So if you have a kid that likes to go deer hunting that's under 21, 20, 19, 18, whatever, they can carry a firearm from their house to their car. They can drive to the deer lease. They can do that because they have a private access to that private property and they can come back home. But if they were to take that gun out of the car in a public area, they stop at the park, they go to Walmart, whatever, now they're in violation of the law. They stepped outside those freedoms of protection that happened inside the vehicle that was on private property and traveling to private property. When they stepped outside of that into the public, that, that's now prohibited conduct. Then we have persons with convictions for any of the following that occurred within the previous five years. This is all new to the constitutional carry. These pro prohibitions did not exist in Texas law prior to the latest legislative session. So anyone who's been convicted of these five crimes within the previous five years is prohibited now from carrying in public. And then any persons listed on the next slide, which is going to be our general prohibited persons and persons otherwise prohibited by law. So if someone is prohibited by federal law from possessing a firearm, they're automatically prohibited by state law. We just wrote that simple clause into our laws that says if the federal government says you can't carry, Texas says you can't carry. So some examples there are people that are uh, wanted. If you're a fugitive from justice, you've lost your right to carry a gun in public. If you're an undocumented immigrant in the United States, you cannot carry a gun in the United States. That's against federal law. So that means it's against state law. And there's a longer, a much longer list than that. Um, and some of it's problematic in enforcement, like people who are drug addicts, they can't carry a gun by federal law. Well, that's kind of hard to prove. We don't really have direct access to their medical records and don't live in their house. So some of that's a little difficult to do. And then for all of these people that can carry, that weapon must be concealed or in a holster. So any person that carries in public, whether it's under the, the, the authority in the open carry laws or under constitutional carry, the only one this doesn't apply to is concealed carry, is that that weapon must always be in a holster. Now, there's no definition of what a holster is, but it must be in one. So they can carry just like I am right now, but if they were to take that gun out of the holster and try to carry it in their hand, they're automatically in violation of the law. What they would have to do to make that legal is they would have to be doing it under the the chapter nine of the penal code, which is what offers, offers us the ability to use force. So they would have to be doing it under one of the circumstances justified under chapter nine of the penal code in defense of themselves or a third person, that kind of thing. But they cannot just simply carry the gun around in their hand. What it also prohibits is I can't just take a gun off my nightstand and shove it in the front of my pants and then go walk around the street. And that's not a holster. So that is also illegal. You can't get too much more into that because, again, there's not a definition of holster. Anything really that protects the trigger guard of the weapon system is probably going to be considered a holster by the state. Anybody jump in anytime you have a question or a comment? So general prohibitions based on who the people are, these are not location specific for the most part, because there's a caveat to every bit of this if we get into that non applicability statute. Anyone who's been convicted of a felony crime. So in Texas, if you've been convicted of a felony offense, you cannot possess a firearm inside your home that most free place for five years of post-conviction. Once you go out into public, you are forever, forever prohibited. 
you've been convicted of a felony, you cannot carry a gun in a car or outside your home ever. It's, it's a permanent prohibition. Uh, someone who's been convicted of assault family violence with injury, so class A misdemeanor level assault family violence or greater, five years after that con conviction or completion of probation. A person who's subject to a protective order. So anyone who becomes subject to a protective order, regardless of their status prior to that protective order going in place, is now prohibited from carrying a firearm. Uh, there are certain circumstances under which law enforcement uh, don't fit that definition, but they're, it's very fact specific. But this is actually something that affects a lot, a lot of people. Um, as an example, I remember responding not so long ago to a guy's house who was served with a protective order, and he was a prison guard in Dybal. And he carried from his house to the prison and back every day because the nature of his job, obviously, he deals with unsavory people who might want to do things bad to him outside the free world. Well, he instantly became prohibited. He could not do that anymore the moment that piece of paper was handed. So not the protective, the protective order is very important for family violence prevention, but they reach much further than what most people think they do in people's lives. And then gang members, uh, interestingly enough, they changed this during this legislative session. Previously, if you were a gang member, a documented gang member, which takes a lot of work to do, you could not carry, period. It became a reason to make it illegal for you to carry a gun. Well, during this legislative session, they said that still holds true, but only if that person is in a car or a boat. So under the new law, someone who is a known documented gang member, and there's a lot of laws and regulations that we have to go through to actually document someone, can walk down the street with a holstered gun. They just can't drive a car with that gun or ride in a car with that gun. I, I, I honestly don't understand the logic behind this particular part. And it wasn't, I don't think it was an oversight because they had to create a new exception for this. Uh, so I guess maybe it was well, gang members do drive bys, and if we don't let them get in the car with a gun, they can't do a drive by. I, I just don't. Know. But that is the law as of right now. And hopefully in two years it will be correct. Because that, that's a big deal for us. Uh, location based. So, this is going to be the stuff that's going to be more specific, probably to the audience that I'm talking to today. So, most businesses represented here fall into the private business category. Accurate, very few government entities represented within the chamber. Uh, so, this is probably where we're going to field most of our questions and where we're going to wonder the most. Essentially, it's up to the owners, managers, is what you will allow. The state doesn't get that much involved as it relates to private property and their ability to regulate <laughs> firearms on their personal private property. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. We'll get into that just a little bit. Uh, but signage is required to prohibit armed customers. So if your property doesn't fall under one of those places that's prohibited by law, by name, like hospitals, and jails, and things like that, you now have to make the decision, will you allow firearms in your establishment and to what degree? Because now you have three levels of possible carry. You have constitutional carry, you have concealed carry and you have open carry. So two of those have licenses, one of them does not. Constitutional carry is obviously any adult 21 years of age or older who's not a prohibited person. And then for open carry and concealed carry, license to carry, if you will, they have to go through the class and they have to get the certification from the state. Uh, it's kind of a running joke within the legislative conversation with people that who benefited the most from House Bill 1927 is people who make signs. <laughs> <laughs> because now if you want if you own a private business and you want to prohibit all firearms from entering your business you have to put up three signs you have to put up the old sign for concealed carry you have to put up the old sign for licensed open carry and now you have to put up a new sign for constitutional carry so as an example if the chamber of commerce wanted to prohibit every person that walked through that door from entering with a firearm that's not a special class they would have to have three signs posted out there where people could readily see them, and they have to fall within the specific regulations that the state provides for that signage. So you have your open carry language. It has to be exactly that language. You have your concealed carry language. It also has to be exactly that language. And then you have your constitutional carry language, which has to be exactly that language. And then each of these signs must be in English and in Spanish. So it's actually six signs if you broke them in half. <laughs> they must be in contrasting colors. They must be in block letters. They must be at least one inch in height and displayed in a conspicuous manner prominently to the public. That's the, 
That's what's cited in two of the three laws. The third law, open carry, actually requires them at each entrance to the property. Yeah. Wow. So <clears throat> therein lies the decisions that you have to make as a private business owner or property manager as to what regulations do you want to put in place. That tells you what signage you need to get. And then my recommendation is if you have a door that the public can walk in, it goes on every door. Because ultimately, the person who breaks the law has to know that that's what they're doing. So because I'm traveling all of these circles, both sides of this argument, I can tell you as an example, Lufkin Mall. How many interests does Lufkin Mall have? <laughs> a huge amount, right? Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, some of those are walk straight into a business, some walk into the commons area of the mall, and you have all of these different, I'm sure they have a membership organization that agrees to certain lease contract pro prohibitions. And if they decide they're not going to allow people to carry in the mall, then everybody has to decide that, right? The independent businesses probably can't make that decision. But I know people that would go to Lufkin Mall and they could tell you that these four entrances have signage. These six entrances do not. So as long as you want to carry in Lufkin Mall, you go in the door that doesn't have the signage. So when the law enforcement contacts you because you're in violation of their signage, you go, I went in this door. I didn't see that sign. And now there's really no enforcement that can be taken against that person. And they can be put on notice at that moment. You are trespassing because you're carrying a firearm. You must leave the premises. And they must. But they will intentionally bypass all of those signage if you don't put them on every. So if you truly want to prohibit all public access to your businesses, to everybody with firearms or anybody, one of the three categories, my recommendation is appropriate signage at every public access that you have. That's the only way that you can be truly protected and say that, yes, we have put them on notice. Bill, does yes, that include um, public access, like there was a hotel that uh, had signs posted in their interior door where the public would come in, uh, but they didn't have them at the exterior doors. So I, I would just defer back to that standard operating <laughs> statement. If people can come and go in that door, it needs to have a sign. Okay. If you want real enforcement. Okay. Now that there's a whole other level to this conversation is about what you expect as the business owner when you have someone who violates what you think. So I believe I've done everything I need to do to put up all my signage. Then I have to decide when I call the police, what are my expectations? Is it that the police are going to immediately arrest this person and cart them off to jail? Or is it that we're going to use this as an educational opportunity and say, hey, here's the deal? Because it is important that we understand from the lay person's perspective, you're just Joe Smith, Texas citizen. It is incredibly difficult for that person, especially under the new constitutional carry to understand what is and is not legal in Texas. It's very difficult for attorneys and police officers who've been doing this for a long time to understand what is and is not legal. So as you work through these issues as a business owner, I just ask that you recognize that the person who walks into your business carrying may honestly not know that what they are doing is illegal. Yes? So actually, just listening to you talk about Constitutional carry obviously is just opened a humongous can of worms, and it actually seems like it's is it tremendously loosened gun law. I mean, that, that's the gun laws, but this the freedoms of people with guns. Is that is that what I'm understanding? It, or not, or not really. I mean, I know the laws are crazy, but I mean, does it seem like it's, it's like you said the gang members are able to walk the street with the gentleman down the camp of the car? I mean, this just seems like I mean, is it really do you see more people carrying guns, or is that where it's headed? I guess. <clears throat> Hard question to answer. Okay. <laughs> no, but, not, but we're going to give it a shot. Okay. Probably not. Okay. So historically, if you look across the United States, yeah. all the states have done this. Yeah. The true numbers, regardless of where you sit on the political spectrum about this argument, are yeah. that the more people are given the authority to carry firearms, crime goes down. And honestly, almost every state that passed a constitutional carry that had a licensing option, yeah. the number of people who got licensed to carry went up, yeah. not down. Almost as almost across the board. Well, I just know, like for example, whenever they did the open carry, wherever long, how long has that been? Probably seven, eight years ago, yeah. years ago, however long. You know, you thought, especially like in Texas, everybody that you, in, in your mind, every person you see now is going to have a six shooter on their hip, and you really just don't see. Very rarely you go to H P or wherever, see somebody or Walmart, someone see them absolutely on their hip. I remember the conversations when open carry became a thing in Texas, yeah. and it's like, oh my god. We're going back to the Wild Wild West, and we're going to have shootouts at noon on the brick streets in front of the CBB. And it 
it's just never happened. Yeah. It, it, so this is kind of the same similar thing, you think? I really think so. I think it's going to be much ado about nothing when it all shakes out. Understood. Um, but I can't say that for sure. Understood. Yeah. Uh, looking at what's happened in other places and looking at how open carrying went in Texas, I think we're going to end up in that same place. I will say that I think some of the unintended consequences are it did take some of the teeth out of what we could do previously when we were dealing with criminals. Actually, like prosecuting and doing the same. Well, and like uniquely what we're dealing with in Nacogdoches right now. We're dealing with a lot of incredibly violent people, but they're all very, very young. And because of a lot of things that Andrew can tell you way better than I can, and COVID being one of the largest, we have a lot of cases that haven't been prosecuted yet. So what I do is I take somebody, and keep in mind juvenile convictions. So if somebody was convicted of a crime as a juvenile, we don't get to use that for much of anything. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other level of law that is in and of itself very complex. So I have to wait for someone to become prohibited. They have to commit a crime over the, at the age of 17 or older. Then they have to work, go through the court system and get an actual final conviction on that crime. And it has to be one of the crimes enumerated before they're a prohibited person. So when, when, when you're dealing with violent gang members who generally fall between the ages of 16 and 22, very few of them have the convictions. They may have the pending cases, but they don't have the convictions so yet in order to be prohibited. So it did take a little bit of the teeth away, but I don't think enough that it's going to be, oh no, we've destroyed our way of enforcing gun laws in Texas. Um, that, that's, that's a great question. Those are the conversations I really want to have. That's the meat potatoes. Yes. Uh, so do you think, I mean, just in general, you know, that's always the talk is, oh, the, you know, I think you said like government's trying to take our guns away. Sure. Do, you, do you feel like this is a step against the war? I mean, I, I know that's a really random question, but I'm just trying to, you know, that's always the biggest thing, especially in Texas. You know, all the time, take our guns away. So, right. I mean, what your perception of that as far as the legislatures and legislators and all that? So, they actually passed another bill during the session also, yeah. which is the Second Amendment Sanctuary State. Yeah. So, Texas now, by definition, is a Second Amendment Sanctuary State. Functionally, that has almost no impact. What it is is a very big message politically, and that's really what that was about. It did change some things functionally, but not anything meaningful. It was Texas's way of saying it's not happening here. Yeah. Not a, for for to see a reversal really in any of this stuff, it would take a huge legislative change. A lot of people would have to get voted out of office because it really did take them ten years to get to this point, and it's going to take a lot of effort to if someone wants to try to get away from this. Um, and are there, are, are there going to be people who carry guns in public that shouldn't be carrying guns? Yes. Are they going to be to the level that we should like sound the alarm? I seriously, seriously doubt that. It's going to have very little noticeable impact, I think, on how law enforcement interacts with the public to reduce crime. Because this isn't the, this is not the issue. Oh, I just had it. Um, Andrew, you the business. Mm -hmm. Okay. That decides not to put signage up because of the fact they need six or eight or ten or whatever. Um, can they allow their employees sure. while they're working there, to but carry? without signage or who's coming into the business? Yes. Okay. Yes. So the signage is going to is not going to have any influence on your employee. Okay. That's going to be for the notice to the public for the customer, really more than it is anything else. Okay. Uh, you could actually. And Andrew, I've never had, I've never gotten into it this deep, but my interpretation would be that you could allow your employees because you're a complainant. So even if you put the signage up and a person enters your building in violation of that signage, it doesn't mean they're going to jail. That's your decision to make. You're the complainant in that case. If we get there and you go, I don't want them to go to jail, I just don't want them to be here, then we're going to ask them to leave. You could do the same with your employees. You could put up signage all over your building and be in full compliance with the law and then say, but I want my employees to be able to carry, and nobody else can come in and say, you can't do that. Is that an accurate assessment? It is. Okay. Yeah, like employee handbook, you're probably like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, there's a whole other side of that argument. Uh, I strongly <laughs> recommend that if you're going to have employees carry, that you go through all of the steps, get the training, uh, to develop policies as it relates to what your expectations are of that employee carrying. I'm certainly not opposed to it because uh, I really know the numbers, I know the statistics. People carrying firearms generally reduces crime, it does not increase it. That is just the nature of the beast. Um, but it all needs to be done well because you need to protect yourself and your business from the liability that does come with that as well. And outside of some ex incredibly extreme circumstances, I will always caution you don't be involved. Be a good witness, let us deal with it. 
there are some circumstances where that's absolutely the right thing to do, though. But they're just very narrow and few and far between. So, what do you recommend if you have all the signs up, you have your at every door, and somebody walks in? As a as a business owner, do you say I should go to the person and say, "Hey, I have my signs up. <laughs> go put it in the car," or should I just call so, call call the police? I'm going to give you some general ideas. It's obviously going to be very fact specific. How do you read that person? What's their demeanor? What does this look like? And you, you have to make some of those decisions. And obviously, you can always defer to us. You can always go, our policy is zero confrontation. Call the police. The only thing I ask is that you, and I'll help you do this if you want to, that you develop a set of protocols when you call us. Because it's much easier for both of us and we get a better product when we communicate clearly across 911 than it is when there's a whole lot of conversation and only about 20% of that is me. And it's nothing, it's just the way people are. If you don't call 911 all the time, you don't know how to talk. And if you're a police officer all the time or a dispatcher all the time, that's what you deal with on the other end. So you ask a bunch of questions. And what it inevitably leads to is very ineffective communication across the phone because we rare, rarely get the information we need. So we're so busy asking questions that we may miss things or they may be about to say something that's important, but we're too busy asking questions that we're just trying to get that those bullet point pieces of information. So as that <laughs> conversation goes, if you don't want firearms in your business, Obviously, post the appropriate signage. My recommendation is to not confront customers really under, under any circumstances. If you do choose to inform the customer, then just do so politely and don't argue. Don't create uh, an issue that never was going to be an issue in the first place. Uh, stay calm, act normal, call the police. Again, this advice uh, it only applies to a peaceful person carrying a firearm against your business policies. Any kind of act of violence is a different conversation altogether. We would have it totally outside the context of this conversation. So you're just running whatever it is you do every day, your business, and you see this person walk in, you value your signage, and you happen to notice they're carrying a firearm. You really got to make that call right then. Do I want to go talk to them? Or do I want to call the police and have them come talk to them? There's pros and cons to both. Obviously, you're creating an opportunity for conflict between you and the customer. But if it turns out to be just a normal, everyday, honest, law-abiding citizen, and you call the police on them, they're probably never going to be a customer again. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's those are the decisions that you have to make as a business. Uh, but I, really, I think that if you trust your gut and read the demeanor of the person, it's going to guide you in the right direction. But if you're a completely non-confrontational person who doesn't do well in those environments, don't, don't confront them. You know that better than I do. Or if you have employees, if you have those employees that are either side of that spectrum, if this employee over here that has a hard time making a sale because they just don't like talking to people, I probably wouldn't have them do any kind of confrontation. <laughs> if you have this other employee over here that makes every person they've ever talked to mad, probably not them either. But if you have those good customer service people who are good at that, by all means, hey man, I like it done, but we don't really allow those in here. Uh, would you mind putting your car, come back in, please shop with us, but we just we don't feel comfortable. Whatever. Now, Keep in mind, we haven't seen this much in Nacogdoches, almost none. There are groups in Texas called Second Amendment Auditors who are privately funded um, political, for lack of a better term, zealots. They, they really firmly believe in what they believe, who will test businesses because they know what the law allows. And if they look at your business and notice that you have two of the three signs, they'll be the one person that doesn't fall under the signage and they'll walk in and try to force a confrontation. So just know those people exist. Now, they don't do it as much with private businesses. They do it a lot more with government. So whether it's walking into a government facility or having an encounter with law enforcement, they're trying to test our knowledge and make us do something that's outside the course of the law. So one, they can sue for it. But it's really not about the money. It's about the media presence. It's about getting it on the national conversation. So we kind of recognize that internally. And I don't think you're ever going to deal with it. But just know that they exist. So you just need to know what you can and can't do. And just don't step outside of it. Always, if when in doubt, call police. Defer to us and listen to their decisions. So we've kind of gone through the meat and potatoes of the conversation, or at least the presentation. But I feel like there's a whole lot more out there that people want to know about. Uh, one of the questions I think that came through was, what about apartment complexes in the common area? For the most part, the state of Texas sees that as part of their house. It's kind of their front yard. So your ability to restrict firearms there is almost none, unless they're one of these the same thing is now extended to hotels. 
So hotels are one of the few places in Texas law where they actually said a hotel cannot prohibit firearms in their building. Now it's limited because if I'm renting a room from you, the way the state looks at that is that is my temporary residence. So the freedoms and protections afforded to me in my permanent residence are now afforded to me here, but just by contract for a limited period of time. But if I can carry a gun in my house, I can carry a gun in my hotel room to protect myself. Well, I gotta be able to get it there. <laughs> so they can carry it from their car through the hotel lobby and into their hotel room. It doesn't mean that they can just freely move about the hotel, but now that hotel is the one that kind of has to regulate that behavior. Because unless they're gonna hire a police officer to stand in their lobby 24 hours a day and regulate all of this coming and going, it's the hotel that has to deal with that. I don't know that that's gonna be an issue in Nacogdoches really at all, uh, but if it becomes that, my, I'm really there to just call it and give people a little bit of latitude because it, that's confusing. It, just like the rest of our laws, it's confusing for them, especially when it's traveling public that doesn't even live in the state of Texas. There's no way they can go up there. What else? So with the hotels and even I think you could think of it for the apartment, you have the customer that lives there or at the hotel mm -hmm. they are in their room, but then there's the general public that is coming and going either in the hotel or visiting somebody in an apartment, but that's not their home. Right. So that's a different customer at sure. that point. So take the hotel for going in. Yeah. So you have a, two restaurants, you have a bar, you have all of the stuff that goes on in the convention areas, mm -hmm. and you have a retail shop in addition to being a hotel. So it's really multifaceted for them. When can they and can't they prohibit someone from carrying on their facility? And it really comes down to whether or not they're a guest, but then do you know who your guests are? Can you identify them by face? Can somebody say that person is or is not a guest in our hotel? Because ultimately you're asking who confronts people so are we going to create a confrontation and then the person go, I'm a guest, but not anymore, I'm out. I know all of my rights. I mean, these are all of those conversations that as a business owner, it gets really complex. Now, obviously the bar, the bar is a prohibited location. It's 51% alcohol sales. They can't carry it. Can't carry it anywhere that has a 51% sign. So now it becomes problematic even for the tenant. I'm a guest of this hotel. I can carry in the lobby from my car to the lobby to my room. But I can't go down to the bar and have a drink. Even though I'm in the confines, the actual brick and mortar confines of this building. And that's really how complex our laws are. What else? Carrying in vehicles, visible, not visible? Can be visible as long as it's in a holster. It cannot be visible if it's outside of the holster. And what should we do if we're pulled up by a policeman and we have a firearm in our vehicle? Be very, very calm. Keep your hands readily visible. And essentially, they're going to go through what's called a seven step violator contact. So, almost every encounter should be substantially similar. They're going to identify who they are. They're going to request your driver's license identification. They're going to tell you why you're in contact. Let them get through their street. Before you reach for a driver's license or a purse or insurance card or whatever, for me, I do the same thing. So I've had a very bad encounter once as a peace officer pulled over. I had another peace officer put a gun to my hand. People are people. And some of them are 21 year old people who have no life experience, who just happen to be in law enforcement with no training. Now, this was many moons ago. We've come a long, long way, 23 years. This was actually 21 years ago. A little tiny rural community southeast of here. Uh, just a speeding contact. I would do exactly today what I did on that stop. That guy just ridiculously overreacted. Uh, it's hands visible, 10 and 2 ish. I'm not overly tense, I'm not scared. I'm just here. They go through their spiel. Yes, I'll be glad to grab my driver's license for you, but you need to know that there's a firearm wherever on my person. Mine, particularly on that day, was in between the console and my seat because when I traveled, that's where I kept it. Um, so I just put them on notice and then just listen to what they have to say, what their instructions are, and follow those instructions. Uh, we have come a long way. Those encounters were much more problematic 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Than it's much more common for us to encounter people who carry. And for the most part, contrary to what some perspectives may be, when I stop a car, which I don't anymore, but when I did, and someone said, yes, sir, I have a firearm, my next question would be previously, do you have a license to carry? Yes, sir, I do. I don't have a heightened sense of awareness at that point. I actually went, 
This is probably just a normal everyday Joe Blow citizen. I can call now. It's not a violent felon that just committed an act of murder. And I don't know. You know it, 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 for the most part, most law enforcement officers see that as this person is not dangerous. The presence of the firearm doesn't make them dangerous. It's their intent. No good. That's what makes them dangerous. What if it's a long gun? That's obviously not. But long guns are prohibited in Texas almost exclusively. There's almost no law in Texas that governs shotguns and rifles. Outside of, you know, if you cut the barrel down to a little tiny short firearm, but that's even problematic now, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's no prohibitions as to loaded or unloaded in Texas. Never, there never has been. And it's funny because I've talked to a lot of people about these topics and some of the misconceptions that are out there that have been out there for an incredibly long time that people are going up, right? I can do this, but I can't do that. Never been the law in Texas. And it's just funny because people have their beliefs. I had them too until I got in here and started doing it as a profession. What's actually the law of people's beliefs is not the same. You can actually have a round chamber in your computer. Absolutely. Board it's on safety. It doesn't even, I don't care if it's on safety legally. Now, if it's not, it's, there's, yeah, all, everybody's yeah, there's all stupid thing that goes on. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah, from the legal perspective, it's a firearm. Yeah. It's a firearm. It matters absolutely not whether or not it's an ammunition in it, what the condition of that ammunition is, what the condition of the motor of the firearm is. It makes absolutely no difference. Now, armor piercing ammunition is really the only thing that Texas governs is the last ammunition. You can't have armor piercing ammunition. Other than that, it's whatever. Mm -hmm. Can a business owner contact you or your office to help go through these questions and sure. develop a policy? Sure, without a doubt. Um, I guess that for those that may watch this recorded online later, um, you know, we'll this off. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have access to my business card. Uh, my direct office line is 936-559-2620. If I'm not there, leave a message. I'll get back in touch with you. I gave my email address, but we have to go through that two or three times. And actually, the email address on here is not right anymore, but if you send to that email address, it will go to me. So I'll get there. What else? Go. Well, let's say I have this jacket on and I have one of those waist uh, holsters and belts. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I walk in uh, to business, not paying attention to signs or anything, but Barbara sees it and brings it to my attention, potentially because you know, I'm not thinking about it because it's just something I'm carrying. Mm -hmm. And this, in this jacket, uh, I politely step out and she brings it to my attention. Or is that considered open carry or is that? As long as you wear the, go the covered garment and you don't intentionally expose the firearm, you are concealed here. So, okay. yes, depends on the signage. So let's kind of walk through each one of those because this is a real encounter. This is something that everybody could possibly deal with. I'm somebody who carries everywhere I go every day, all the time. I'm just Joe Smith, citizen. But every single day, I carry the same gun in the same holster at the same place. And I wear some kind of cover garment. It's very common, whether it's a vest or a jacket or whatever. It's just become part of my personality. It's who I am. It's as comfortable as my watch. Mm -hmm. So I happen to walk into this business. Maybe I don't pay attention to the sign because heaven forbid I was on my cell phone. So I'm <laughs> jacking it up with whoever it is on the other line. I just happen to walk in, blah, blah, blah. And I'm wearing this cover garment. And as I take my cell phone and I go to put it in my pocket, my cover garment moves to the rear. My phone goes in my pocket, but it exposes my holster fire. The cover garment comes back across. I go about my shopping business. Then the owner or manager comes up to me and goes, sir, I'm sorry, we have a prohibition. We're carrying a firearm in our business. We had signage posted on the door and I noticed your firearm. So at this particular moment, I have technically violated the law because I passed that sign. Now, part of it is I don't have any intent. So our job as law enforcement, I have to prove that what that you knew what you did. We don't try to go after and arrest people for complete mistakes. So there's one issue that comes up there. The law actually provides for that issue. Once I'm put on notice, that I cannot be inside this business and I leave, it's almost unenforceable. I'll just put it that way. There is still something we can do as law enforcement, but it would be a little silly to do it. We can write you a ticket, essentially. Uh, so the, the, the intent of the law is to keep people who are carrying a gun from going places where people don't want them to go. We just accomplished that intent. We just accomplished exactly what was supposed to happen. You thought you were doing something correct. Someone informed you that you didn't. Even if we get involved at this point and you go, I have, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I'll, I'll leave or I'll put my gun away. Good. We're not. That, that should be the end of it right there. We accomplished the intent of the law. Will it always be the end of it? No. Because people are going to get it wrong because the laws are too complex. So I, I, 
meant to bring this up at some point in the conversation. I think this is a good place to do it. Uh, police officers are people. They're going to make mistakes. Be patient with us. The laws are complex. They are hard to digest, especially when an agency is very young, like ours happens to be right now. Um, so from the, the layman's perspective, the person, as long as it's my intent to conceal the gun, and I'm in some condition where concealment is required. As long as I don't intentionally display that, <coughs> sweep the cover garment out and tuck it behind the gun, that's inadvertent. That is not a violation of law. For you to be in violation of that law, you must intentionally display that firearm. So I have to know that you did it on purpose. <laughs> but that unintentional flashing because of the cover garment, that's, that's not a violation. Okay. Another question. Let's say the Blueberry Festival is happening. And I've got some sharp pants or plus jeans and a shirt on. Uh, it's a public venue. Mm -hmm. Is it May May on? You can carry just like I am right now, just back to back. <laughs> yep. You can walk down the middle of Main Street during the Blueberry Festival looks just like me. Just don't have nothing that says police on it. And you are perfectly within the law as long as you're not one of those prohibited people and you're 21 years of age. Or older. And you have to have a license to do this? Nope. That is constitutional carry in and of a nutshell. That, that environment right now. It's a public place. No private business owner can tell me I can't because it's an absolutely true public place. It is. I carry it in a holster. I'm not a prohibited person. I'm 21 years of age or older. That's constitutional care. Yes, sir. There's two things, but I wanted to do what I think is the most important one first. Sure. When uh, in school with uh, uh, carry of guns or possession of guns, uh, Previously, at, in the Nacogdoches schools, it was prohibited to have a gun in the parking lot in your car. But now that's no longer, it's, it's okay to have a gun in your car, but not on your person if you step out of your car. So it's okay there. But there's also a part of that law that we have a cross country meet at the Com Park. Now that, that's become an extension of, our, of us, but I think we're responsible for posting a sign that says this is NISD track meet or something. I don't know. Do, uh, you, I don't, do you recall anything on that? I don't okay. know. It's any place where we have athletic competition, uh, uh, weapons are prohibited there. Right. Uh, so I don't think that there's any requirement legally, like there's nothing in the statute that says you have to put up signage that that is that now an extension of the school. Because you're right, all of the laws that prohibit firearms from going on the school property extend to any event where it's a, a school, a UIL event, a school sanctioned event, an athletic event is occurring. Uh, the bigger problem there is the enforcement. Because I have to be able to prove the person who violated the law and knew that that was a school sanctioned event when they got to that property. So it's going to be very fact specific as to whether or not you have an actual violation. But the prohibitions are there, and you do not have to put up signage. <coughs> For instance, let's say the school had an ongoing issue at one location, they decided based on prior acts, we want to do an aggressive enforcement. At this particular venue that's an off site location, my recommendation would absolutely be at least very visible signage that says I would copy the legal language and UIL sanctioned school event is occurring on this property, firearms are not allowed. Because now people are put on use. It takes away that ability to say, I didn't know this was a school event, I was just coming to the park or whatever. So I think there's some ways to, to make that law more enforceable, but absolutely those prohibitions follow the school as those events go. That's your question. Yes, but this also goes to churches and, and all the other places where it's prohibited. It's legal to have it in your car and in the with the car in the lot, but it, you can't have it in the open on the lot or, or go through the door of the building, right? It's going to be different depending on the specific location. So there are some places that are categorically banned because of the nature of the place you can't carry their period. There are other places where it falls upon the, the location to make that decision. Churches is one. Churches used to be naturally prohibited. You could not carry in a church. That's not the case anymore. Now churches can allow carry in their churches if they want to. So it's going to be very dependent upon the place. So if it's not one of those places, again, this is my recommendation, because we could really get into the weeds about places where weapons prohibited. Um, if it's not one of those places that's specifically enumerated as being prohibited, and you want to prohibit firearms, go with the sign. Even if the signage doesn't necessarily apply to you by statute, it puts the people, the everyday citizen, on notice that firearms are prohibited in that place. Because that's really what it all comes down to is people don't know they're in violation of the law. There's nothing we can do about it 
other than tell them they're in violation of the law and ask them to not be in. Good, good stuff. <coughs> What else? Since I'm a freestanding emergency room, I'm not a hospital, and we're privately owned, that would be our choice as to what That would be my understanding, yes. I don't think my doors are good enough for all this time. I know this sounds, this sounds trivial, but if I was, say, a downtown business, a shop downtown, how much time and effort do you think they put into the ambiance of the approach of their business? Oh, well, right, and now I have I have two windows, maybe this yeah. size, yeah. and I want to prove it all fire arms. I just changed the entire look of my business. Industry. Absolutely, you can't see my the things I have for sale because you're too busy looking. At, you can't read your own yourself. And it, it it is a little, a little, it's a little too much. Well, the reason I ask is because we had, um, you know, I had doctors that that carry, you know, because I mean you, you have circumstances like that. Yes. Well, one physician we had a patient and it um, brought their child in, and he happened to notice that the, the man was had a firearm. He said, Well, that makes me very nervous. Would you say something to him? I said, It's not bothering me. You know, and, and we were trying to transfer the child, and, and I don't know if the anyway, it was a police officer. You know, so <laughs> he said, He went in and said something to him. He said, Well, I'm sorry, I'm a police officer. Yeah. And he felt a little bit better. Sure. But, you know, you, you're upset with me. You, I'm not one of you. You <laughs> call <laughs> <laughs> I got no problem with. You know? Yeah. But, and the reality of it is this carrying a gun is a murder. Mm -hmm. I've been doing it for 23 years, so I'm very, very familiar with it. But if I had my brothers, I wouldn't be wearing this seven pound thing on my right hip that makes it uncomfortable to sit in a chair. And that's really what you're going to see from the general public is you're going to, just like we saw with open carry. When open carry first came out, a lot of people did it. Nowhere near as many as everybody predicted, but a lot of people did it. Within about two weeks, I'm not doing it because it's just a pain. It's a burden. Um, the, the biggest problem that we've seen, to be honest with you, from a law enforcement perspective, is the number of gun sales that skyrocketed over the last 12 years. Like, it's crazy. I can give you some numbers, but like Glock, probably the most popular semi-automatic pistol in the United States, manufactured 10,000 pistols a day. A day. And those are all essentially spoken for guns. They're selling them as fast as they can push them off the line. It's bad enough that they won't sell parts to gunsmiths to fix them because they need all the parts to make the guns that they're selling. The issue that we have is that there's a lot of people who, for lack of better terms, would not have owned a gun previously that now do. And they don't take all the responsibilities that come with gun ownership. So what we end up with is a ridiculous amount of guns in people's cars, at their house or at their place of business. And more often than not, the cars need to lock. So what that ends up being is we have a huge amount of gun theft in that And This is national. It's happening everywhere. We're not unique. Um, it's become a business. There are parts of organized crime in every community in the United States, including Nacogdoches, that intentionally target certain neighborhoods because they know the propensity of having a firearm in the vehicle is higher. The chance of the, gun, the car being locked is lower. So they go and they target these neighborhoods and they steal guns for the sole purpose of getting them into the hands of the people that can't otherwise live possess them. So by proxy, what we've done is we've created a new mechanism to provide firearms for criminal element, and it's incredibly profitable because they're always successful. So if I could put out any message to the public, it's talk to your friends, talk to yourself, don't leave guns in your cars. Please, please, please don't leave guns in your cars. It's a very big problem. So then I have a question. Let's say I know I can't walk in a chamber with a gun on. I take it out and put it in my car. And my hope is that they don't target this parking lot. Because that's where I <laughs> <laughs> You're absolutely right. <laughs> yes. And it's it's burdensome on the person who wants to carry. And this is another reason that if people are being responsible, really thinking through the whole idea of carrying something like this, which they should be. I mean, if we're honest about it, the whole purpose in carrying a firearm is that you think today you might have to take a person's life. Right? Why else would I carry it? Unless I have a problem with rabbit dogs in my neighborhood or <laughs> mean rabbits. I don't know. But that's really what it is. And that's an intensely personal commitment to not only choose to carry it, but to choose to carry all the responsibility that comes with it. So if I'm just a Joe Citizen, I walk into the chamber and they say, sir, you can't carry it. I have a couple of options. Figure out another way to do my business at that place. Choose not to do business at that place. 
or go put my gun in my car. All of those are viable options to any person. Let's figure out a way to come when I'm unarmed, if that's something I'm willing to do, take my business elsewhere, or put the gun in my car. And more often than not, as long as I, and this is just now it's me talking, I believe that if that first encounter is non confrontational, the conclusion is almost exclusively going to be I'm going to put my gun in my car. I'm going to come in and do whatever it was I had planned to do, my, my shopping or whatever. So make a good decision. Don't go open your car, throw it down on the driver's seat, close the door, and walk back into the business. <laughs> Don't put it somewhere where people can see it from the outside. If you're driving a car that has a trunk, put it in the trunk. Now, here comes the other issues with that. How many people are watching you <laughs> out there in the parking lot taking off your gun and putting it somewhere? <laughs> How many of those are going to call 911 and say, we've got an active shooter at the Chamber of Commerce. I saw him getting his gun out of his trunk. And, and these are really all the conversations that we need to be having with each other. People need to be making some very intense personal decisions about what they are and not what they do. And then you have the whole use of force conversation that comes if you make that decision to carry, which is really outside the scope of probably what everybody wants to stay for. Um, but those are all absolutely the right questions. And those are the conversations we need to be having. Well, uh, well uh, you might as well, and it's not really pertaining to this as much, but as far as like your home, like your yard, and protection of that, I know that, that may have changed over the years. So, what does that look like? And, it, it, and I guess the second question is that pertain to your, to let's say your uh, to your office and your parking lot. Is that too similar as far as protection for that? If you see somebody waving a gun around in your parking lot at your office versus, you know, waving a gun around in your yard or something, or trying to break in, what is that? So yes and no. Okay. So as we, if we were to get into the weeds of what the statutes say, there are some specific specificities broken down based on location, mm -hmm. but functionally, probably not. Okay. So Texas does have the castle doctrine, yeah. and all that really means is that you no longer have a duty to retreat in Texas. So previously, for the normal everyday citizen, if there was an opportunity where you thought the deadly force was the right choice, you had to show that you either attempted to retreat and couldn't. Or there were some circumstances under which retreat was not an option. So that what the Texas law said essentially was that instead of taking a person's life, you need to leave it, unless there's some set of circumstances that don't allow that. Castle Doctrine did away with that. So here's what I'll tell everybody. Don't get in the weeds as to what the law says in the verbiage as to when you can and cannot use the deadly force. Think of it this way. Are you saving your life? Are you saving the life of another person? You can't say yes to one of those two questions. Deadly force is the wrong choice. It is not worth killing someone because they're breaking into your car. Be a good witness, call the police, get great descriptions of who they are, what they look like, where they're going, let us catch them, and we'll try to get your stuff back. And whether or not you value your stuff over that person's life is not even a conversation. The real conversation is you have no idea what you're about to get yourself into. Even if in the end you were found justified, the, what you're about to go through the court systems will change who you are forever. Not only as a person in your soul, but financially and everything else that you have that makes you who you are is going to change after that moment. It happens to police officers when they have to do it. And without a doubt, the moment that that trigger is pressed, you have violated Texas law. So understand that to shoot another person in the state of Texas is illegal. There are certain circumstances under which it is justified. That doesn't make it not illegal. So what's going to happen is at the very, very least, best case scenario, if we're going to come to the investigation or the sheriff's department, whatever venue you're in, in that case, that information is going to go before the district attorney's office, and they are going to take it to the grand jury. They're going to go talk about it to 12 people who don't know you probably and weren't there, and they're going to do the best they can to describe the events that occurred that day. That grand jury is then going to decide whether or not you are charged. If you are charged, you are arrested, you are booked into the jail, and you have to post bond. And it's going to be either for aggravated assault or murder, almost exclusively some of the highest charges in the state of Texas. If you were indicted, unless you choose to plead to something, there's a great chance you're going to go to court. You're actually going to go to trial. Now you're, if it's a murder case, you're probably close to $100,000 in legal fees by the time you get to the court. And then you are hoping that 12 people that sit in that jury box believe that you did the right thing. Because if not, your life is functionally ruined. So regardless of what Texas law says, you may or may not be able to get away with it, but can do. If you're not saving your life or the life of another person, taking another life is not the right choice. 
That's just built in. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. And if you're breaking into my car, my house, I may come out and beat you profusely with no weapons. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to shoot you. Unless you give me some specific articulable reason, something I can say to a normal everyday person. Put out a gun to my head. And <laughs> yeah, I went out there, shot a flashlight at him. And suddenly he comes out with a baseball bat and swings it in my head. Rules of the game just change. It's not some 16 year old kid trying to find some pocket change or even somebody looking for one of my guns. But herein lies the issue. We just talked about leaving guns in cars, right? When they break into your car, if you left your gun in there, what did you just do? You potentially gave them the gun they're going to use against you or me when I come to your 911 call. So, I mean, that is really a big issue to me. It's a big problem. But these are really the conversations we need to be having and having them openly, honestly. Yeah. Yes, so sir. That's on your property and potentially the extension of the council law is trying to get into your vehicle. And if you try to detain them without a gun, more than likely they're just going to leave, right? Sure. If you try to detain them, you call it a sheriff or police to come get them because they're actually trying to break them. They're not going to listen to you. They're thinking they're thinking, hey, probably not. <laughs> so then at that point, what do you do? Hypothetically, or you you got to make that decision. So you have the rights in Texas. You have almost every this almost all the same legal authority and rights that I do as it comes to citizens arrest. So the things that I can arrest for that occur in my view, the, the times under which I can arrest without a warrant from a judge are almost identical whether you have this badge on or not in Texas. Citizens arrest in Texas are almost always a bad idea. That happens every single day. Because literally every single day in Nacogdoches, there's a citizen's arrest. When we go to Walmart almost every single day because they have a shoplifter that they have detained. Technically, that is a citizen's arrest. The arrest occurred when Walmart security staff took possession of that person and took them to the security office. Now, it doesn't functionally work that way. Obviously, the real arrest occurred when we get there and take possession of them because sometimes we just drive on the citation. But you're almost exclusively always better off, even if you want to make the confrontation, we could get into the tactics of it if you wanted to, uh, probably in a sidebar conversation. Uh, my background also is I spent 14 years doing private training as it relates to everything from the first gun carrier to some high level government people at local place. I won't get too much into that, but we could have that conversation. Um, if you want to do the confrontation, do it at distance, do it behind cover, do it verbally, give them commands. If they don't comply, let them go. As long as they don't turn and create the push the aggression toward you, let them go. Let them go. Even if we don't find them, what's the outcome? So Hopefully, you don't have something of such great value in your car that you're like, I'm willing to die for that. Yeah. I guess there could be that circumstance. <laughs> Andrew, any thoughts you'd like to share with us? Um, I mean, you're pretty dead on. I, I think the, uh, yeah, with regard to prosecution, obviously, if you were acting, Justifiably, even though it is against the law to, to take life of another, it is a defense that depending upon the facts and circumstances. You know, realistically, uh, if if you know you were acting right and the law supports you, we're not trying to push it one way or the other, right? We present the facts as they are, big bad nothing, to a neutral body. A neutral body is great, right? So anytime a life is taken, it deserves an independent eye to look at that. Look at those. Just like you would want if it was a vehicular manslaughter, it may have been civilly negligent uh, where a life was taken. Um, you want an independent body to, 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 to say, okay, uh, what happened? What are the facts? What's the law? How we apply law to those facts? Do, <coughs> do, do the facts meet the definition of this law? Because we're not going to push it one way or the other. Um, and, and same thing goes if, if y'all are having to draw down on somebody. Uh, and this kind of this a rule that I tell my wife that the moment you pull back on somebody, maybe you're ready to use it. Um, so don't ever draw down on somebody unless you're, you're prepared to, 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 to pull the trigger. And if it's about property or if it's about stuff, just, just don't. You know, it's not worth it. Uh, uh, you know, I'll get you know, my, my soapbox. Because, guys, if someone, I, it, it would be hard for me, I think, because I got two little boys in the house and a mom, and somebody's trying to break into the, the car. Of the house in the middle of the night, my knee jerk reaction is to grab a firearm, go through rooms and hallways, uh, you know, and, and get arrested. Uh, but you have to temper that with um, 
reason and logic and what is going to be the end result here? What am I going to accomplish if, if I take that life and I wasn't justified in doing so, even though he was on my property trying to take my stuff? Um, you get in some, some serious trouble. Um, and so it's just not it's just not working. You know, now obviously if, if you feel truly that your life is being threatened because they've got a deadly weapon, they you know got a crowbar in their hand or a baseball bat, then you they you left the firearm in your car and, and uh, he's got a hold of it, yeah, by all means, you know, take the actions you feel justified in taking. But if it's if it's just something simple, uh, I say simple because we deal with it all the time. I, to y'all, this is like a one-off holy smokes, but uh, uh, but but if it's something like they're trying to get into your car and to get to lose change and you left it unlocked, I mean, the, just the, the real the real result is 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 far more complicated and it does start up the chain of events in process. So if they're breaking in, mm -hmm. home, yes, just the actual act crawling through the window, right. Right, and you don't know why they're there, right? Obviously, if it's two o'clock in the morning, if somebody shows up at my house two o'clock in the morning, it's a big problem, right? Uh, uh, just go with the police call first. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, are you up? <laughs> I just, I, you take thoughts, you yeah. think, you know, if somebody's busting into your house two o'clock in the morning, you hear glass breaking. Uh, and, and they're in your house, and, and this is cool common law stuff before we had the model penal code, and, and it was if there was a burglary in the nighttime, you were justified in taking the force. It is a judgment call. Just understand that the moment that you pull that trigger, there are going to be collateral or maybe unintended consequences for taking that life. And, and we have to look at the facts. You can say, hey, the A, B, and C happened, and, and the evidence tracks that A, B, and C happened. And the facts are good and the laws behind you, you're going to be fine. But if there's a way to stop thing, is there a way, you know, is, it would just be smart for me to, to, to call the police and maybe rack that shotgun? Because uh, uh, that's that's a very distinct noise that will, you know, generally scare some folks off. But it is illegal to discharge a firearm into the air. I don't know. I think maybe in that sort of scenario, I'm not saying do that, but yeah, if you're in the city limits, just start with a firearm. <laughs> uh, uh, if, if you're if you're getting burglarized and you you fire a warning shot off, uh, just make sure that you're not aiming any bedrooms upstairs. Uh, no, I, you check reasonable things. Honestly, call the police the moment you do that, um, and arm yourself in case something happens, but let them do the job. And then when they show up. Make sure the weapon's on the ground uh, and the two have stepped away from it. So, <laughs> so uh, interestingly enough, prior to this, we had a kind of sidebar conversation about the possibility that we may extend this conversation into some of the, the home defense planning and kind of all of that part of this, because it applies to businesses too. Because as you're talking through this, I'm thinking of all of those things. I have a tier one plan, I have a tier two plan, I have a tier three plan. And that's really what it's about is planning. God forbid any of this ever happens. I don't want anybody to lose their life. But you really need to have plans in place. It's no different than having a plan for a fire. Stuff happens, but have a plan in place. And really, the, the law is very subjective. As much as we want it to be objective, it can't, because all of the truth about all the players is going to come into the court. And that's going to play into the decisions of not only law enforcement, but the prosecutor's office and the jury <laughs> as they make those decisions. So the realities of it are what you could get away with under that certain exact scenario you just gave is different than what I could get away with. Now, if I'm not a police officer and I have all the training and background and all the other things that I have, I probably can't do what you could get away with doing because a jury is going to look at me differently, my history and who I am, my size and all of that differently than they look at you. And all of that's going to play into that. Obviously, I would rather you defer to staying alive than any of these other conversations. So if you choose, truly and genuinely believe that you are in danger of dying or suffering serious bodily injury or that your family is, do whatever it takes to protect you. But it, it, as we relate back, and maybe I'm, I'm just trying to get it out there that we need to plan for these things. So let's go back to our original conversation about the guy breaking into my car. If I'm home alone, I will handle that completely different than if my wife and son are home. Because I am the only bear protecting them from whatever this person is capable of doing. I don't know anything about it. I don't know if they're just a homeless guy trying to make a meal, or if this is a career criminal who's high on ECP. Those are very different spectrums of this engagement. 
if I go out there by choice and choose to engage this person and I lose, he now has freedom to do whatever he wants to do to all of my people in all of my places because I chose to go out there. When I can think differently and go through those planning and go, okay, I'm going to go to the tier three layer of my protection plan and encounter him by cover and distance, knowing that if this doesn't go right, I go to tier two. If that doesn't go right, I go to tier one. And my family knows what all those are. I have panic words, I have safe words. We have specific plans for all of these. If the bad guy comes from that direction, this is what we're going to do. If the bad guy comes from that direction. I mean, it's just conversation at that point, but also what it does is it lets you really analyze yourself and really start thinking about what am I actually willing to do? Because the worst thing in the world you can do is threaten someone with a firearm if you're not willing to use it. It happens all the time. Uh, and I don't want you to think that the law's against you, because that's certainly not the message. I can recall just off the top of my head, I didn't try to research this before I came in. I went to CID in, in 2010, so I'm just at 12 years now in the criminal investigations division, and I can recall off the top of my head three times that I've investigated a homicide where we did not arrest the person who did it. Because we knew on the face of it, this is going to be justified. So that person was never charged. They were never arrested. It went to grand jury. There were no bill. It was over. That doesn't mean that there's not some possibility of civil and all that other cost-effective stuff. Uh, but we don't play in that world. So from the criminal side, we did our job. It looked like what they did was reasonable. It's time to refer it to the district attorney's office. Let him present it to 12 other people. So the law is not against you. If you're right, the law will almost exclusively support you. If you're wrong, the law should almost exclusively prosecute you. Right. It's, uh, and, and to that point, where we're talking about, like you said, with regard to the law being subjective, only because you know, the law is made by us, right? And, we, and the law is enforced by us. Uh, we try to be as objective as we can be, uh, but it is actually subjective. Well, they have put within the law uh, a reasonable person standard, right? So it's not what I would do, not what he would do, uh, but what would a reasonable person in those in that same scenario do? Uh, and, it, and I guess, but the point of all that is, if you can avoid it, avoid it. But by all means, if you feel like your life is threatened, if you have you have you're, you're allowed to take the the, the measures uh, to counteract that. Just just understand that what comes after it uh, is not always. Uh, not to mention the, you know, the, the real burden. Everybody said, everybody says, well, you know, I can take a life. If somebody's threatening my family. You're gonna have to carry that. So, um, you know, just uh, like what he was talking about. If you uh, if you draw down on somebody, if you pull pull down on somebody, uh, it, it is it's it's a game changer. So, uh, uh, review or summary. Okay, so if you're a business, you choose not to post the signs. You somehow see the bulge in your clothing, or somehow you detect the persons in your business with a gun, a pistol, because that's you're not going to have a big one in there. Right. Okay, and you so you still have the right to say, I I I suspect you have a firearm on you, and I don't want that in my um, business. I'm asking you to leave. You have that same right with with or without posted signs. Okay, so and then you could still call the police. Right. Okay. The only difference is when it changes the person's notice that they may be in violation of the law. That's all the signage really accomplishes. Uh, and it changes when when we can and can't force certain things. But for the most part, from the from the business owner's perspective, if you just don't want to worry about the signage, you want to kind of take it on a case by case basis, you can absolutely do that. You have the ultimate right over your business. And ultimately, what it comes down to is if you want someone to leave your business, and this just happens to be firearms that we're talking about, you have the right to tell them. And we can come and enforce that and say, I don't care that you don't agree with why this person is telling you to leave. They own it. They have the right to, to tell you not to be here. You have to leave. It just may change some of the stuff on our side, on the procedural side, or what the level of offense is and stuff like that. But that doesn't affect the, the business owner. That, that's strictly for us. I was going to make myself a move and I've already forgotten what it was. Quick question about the convenience store in and out. Good boys up on the side. The convenience store has signs. It's all just like any other business. It's not a prohibited location because they're not a 51% sale location. Um,
keep the questions coming. I'll stay here as long as y'all want to talk. <laughs> and I really enjoy this interaction. I enjoy talking about these things uh, and because it gets the truth out there and it gets people thinking. Because when y'all leave here, you're going to talk to somebody else about our conversation. Maybe that will bring up new questions. We'll really get real information out there, right? honest, forthright conversations about these kind of things. Yeah. Sorry. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing um, since we're here and we have this information, we're um, a little bit more better than the, the guy out that doesn't have this information. And therefore, if we're caught in a situation that we talked about, that uh, Mr. Jones talked about, we could have some, some further issues because we, we are educated. Sure. So the law always falls on what's called culpability. It's a culpable mental state. So what did the person know at the time they committed, they did whatever act it is that they're alleged to have committed? And sometimes the more that you know, the more that you know. And if you know now that we've talked about it, it's illegal to do X, and you do X, you do. You can't really fall back on the law. I didn't know. Even though technically in Texas law, it's not a defense prosecution to not know that the conduct is illegal. The couple of mental state follows whether or not you did that conduct intentionally or whatever level of mental state there is, not that you knew it was illegal. It's what were you thinking about what you were doing. I mean, if you do it completely subconsciously, that's a problem we have to deal with. Because you have criminal negligence, uh, reckless, intentional, and, or knowingly and intentionally. Those are the four couple of mental states in Texas law. Um, and sometimes those become problematic for us because we have to prove that the person's conduct was done within that, culp that culpability as defined by the statute. But the idea is the more that you know, the less likely you are to do whatever X. Well, and it, it kind of goes back to the whole, as someone who's done martial arts my whole life, there's always been this misnomer in public that you know, because you have all this training, it means that you're this deadly weapon or whatever. I mean, we hear that kind of stuff all the time. That is not true. If the condition that I was in when I had to hurt somebody is a condition that people look at and go, yeah, I would have hurt them too, it doesn't matter what my training was up to that point. It just means I hurt them better. I mean, it, <laughs> probably less likely to get hurt on that one. <laughs> but the moment that I made that decision, like Andrew said, if I was doing what a reasonable person would have done at the same time, regardless of training and background, I'm protected by the law just like anybody else. If what I did was unreasonable for a normal person, then I'm not protected by the law. And that's kind of what we hope to get from the legal system. And one quick scenario that I hesitate to ask this question. But some years ago, I was traveling, uh, just shopping out of town. Mm -hmm. Stopped and realized that's not the police store, which is one of the reasons why I turned out potentially not going to be under. But I was getting some gasoline, had presents in the back seat. And I general approach came, which got there against an hour chit chat. Um, kept looking at the car, started asking me some random questions where I live, uh, trying to continue the conversation. And I know two other people started approaching me. We got in a little scuffle. I did get in the car and left, got a little angry, came back. They all you know, they just tried to jump me and take my stuff. <laughs> so at that point, I said, you know what? When I travel, I'm going to have some just in case. Now, I did leave. I got angry and went back. But I think if I had a visible weapon, they would have been trying to jump me and take my stuff, but I'm hearing it would have been best to let them have my stuff. I'm thinking, hey, hey. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to tussle a little bit before all three of them got a phone to me. You have to get the car and get out of there. So the context in which we had the prior, the prior conversation is significantly different, and that's that I was at my house. So at my house, I have, again, I can't help but automatically think in my mind the layers of defense, the layer of protections that I have in my house. So if you fall back to the previous conversation we had, put yourself in some context in your own home where something attracts your attention to your car and you notice someone breaking into it. Well, almost exclusively across the board, everybody in their mind is looking out a window. That's a layer of protection. Right now, I have absolutely no reason to believe that whatever crime is occurring in my car is going to enter my home. So as it is right now, I am not in danger at all. The moment I exit my door, I have chosen to put myself in danger. That doesn't mean it's the wrong decision. It just means I have to consciously know that that's just what I did. There's a difference when I am away from all of those protections and I, I am a targeted person. They've targeted to attack me, not my car, that they probably 99% out of 100 times don't want me to know about. 
So there's a very big difference in the mindset of a criminal who will try to attack a car at three o'clock in the morning, hoping to get away scot-free without ever, anyone ever knowing they were there, as opposed to a criminal who is going to potentially target an individual in a public place. And honestly, the worst time to deal with one of those confrontations is between your car and the structure. So out in the open public. And really one of the places that we, when I taught these classes that I tried to teach the most is pumping gas. Because if you think about it, you're exclusively stuck between your car and gas pumps. And at least one direction has been shut off by the hose that goes to your car. Mm -hmm. You are essentially standing in a closet in public. Mm -hmm. If a person wants to confront you there and is willing to exact violence upon you, you are in one of the worst possible places you can be. So honestly, I'll get to more of what you talk about in a minute, but I'm gonna hit these little points as we go along. When I pump gas in my car, I'm standing ever. Like ever. I will put the nozzle in my car, I will turn it on, I will either go sit in the car, or I will go stand at the front. It depends on whether or not I have my family with me, what I've seen going on around me at the time. But you will never catch me standing in between my car and a gas pump with the nozzle in my car. Because take all of this active violence part of it out. Somebody loses control on the roadway, here they are headed towards your vehicle. They're drunk, they passed out, they had a heart attack. And it just so happens they're headed towards your car. Where are you gonna go? How are you gonna get out of there without getting run over? Good luck. Because you put yourself in a position where you're locked in on three sides and now you're trying to outrun a moving vehicle. It's just a really, really bad place to be geographically. And those things are gonna come into the conversation if you do have to do something and we show up, we're gonna look at it from that reasonable person perspective. What would I have done putting aside my training experience in the same context as to what this person did? And again, that duty to retreat isn't there anymore. It doesn't mean that jurors won't think about it. So to recognize ultimately, regardless of what this book says and all the conversations that are gonna happen in that courtroom, 12 people are gonna make a decision. It's gonna impact you profoundly in either direction. So, Ultimately, it always comes back to that same thing. If I, can, if I can legitimately say that I was in fear for my life or the life of another person, I will absolutely take another life I have to. Outside of that context, I won't. Now, there's a whole lot of other variables that fall within the conversation you're talking about. Obviously, the returning to the scene, bad idea. <laughs> Park somewhere where you can see. No, no, no. I, I, trust me, I really understand. <laughs> But in the context of the moment, I caution anyone from thinking that knowing a firearm is present, is present is going to be the deterrent. It will be for the people who weren't going to hurt you anyway. For the people who are truly committed to what they're willing to do, if that includes physical violence against you, that firearm's not a deterrent. They're fighting me. I put on my blue uniform, I go work these streets, and they're willing to fight me. It's obvious I brought a gun. I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. I got all this other stuff on my Batman belt, and they don't care. If those people are the ones choosing to victimize you, seeing that gun is going to make absolutely no difference. They do not care. I don't, from a tactical perspective, a personal application out of the world perspective, open carry is crazy. It is not smart. Because if the person is truly committed to exacting violence today, you're just the first target. They will isolate you because you're the only threat in the public. And they will track you and they will see you and you will become part of their equation. If I'm just everyday Joe Smith wearing a blazer and I'll look, I'm not a script, it gives me the advantage if that happens to occur while I'm there. I now can track them. I now can go to a place and do all the things that I'm supposed to do, looking at targets, foreground, background, all of that other stuff, because I put myself in that position. Carrying openly is a really, really bad idea. You just become a target. Interestingly enough, I remember what I wanted to say. Uh, the only prohibition to carrying a long gun in Texas exists now because of open carry. The criminal trespass statute, if you put a no firearms criminal trespass sign that we talked about, that applies to all firearms. So now, not that you couldn't before, now you can put a sign up that not only prohibits people from carrying a pistol, but a shotgun or a rifle. It just, it's a no firearms clause within the criminal trespass statute. So you can actually do that with signage. Previously, if somebody walked into your business carrying an AR-15 strapped across their back, could you tell them to leave? Yep. 
just like a candidate. It's your business. You have the right to decide who comes and goes. If you don't want them in there, you can politely ask them to leave or you can ask us to leave. But just know that that is in the statute. Anything else? Lieutenant Kennedy, I apologize. I have a conference call, but, but I do have a question. Sure. And, and maybe you've addressed it already. We'll do it again. Should an average citizen either conceal or open carry under any circumstances? If a person is going to choose to carry, and that's an intensely personal decision, it takes a lot of conversation to build up to that decision. If a person is going to choose to carry, it should always be concealed. My personal opinion, not speaking for the police department, that's just Bill Kennedy standing in front of you. It, to me, you absolutely accomplish nothing other than encourage confrontation when you open carry. I'm a, all right, take a lay person like Wayne Mitchell, who knows little or nothing about guns, but he's got one. Sure. <laughs> Should I? Yeah. <laughs> if you are willing, if you are willing to do the due diligence that comes with the responsibility, absolutely. If you're not willing to do the due diligence that comes with the responsibility of carrying a firearm, absolutely not. And it is the circumstance you would advise to carry or not to carry. It falls, it's the exact same answer because I carry everywhere I go every day, all the time, no matter what I'm doing. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it's the only way I can guarantee, or at least increase the odds. At Astronomically, to me and my family going to save everything no matter what. It's also the only way that I can guarantee that I can protect your family in church or at Walmart or wherever. Now, I think that would be true of me regardless of whether or not I chose the career path that I did. Uh, a lot of that comes from my historical background and my family was and all the prior military and all of that other stuff. Um, the but tradition does factor in. Sure, it's, it's, sure it does. Well, it's a mentality. Yeah. It, that's really what it is. Or culture. Yes. Um, because if we're talking about it completely and honestly, there's two kinds of people that carry guns. Those people who honestly are willing to use them, and those people who know they are not. If you're one of the two and you're not the first one, don't carry a gun. Don't carry a gun. It's no different than if I said suddenly the way that we protect ourselves in our society is with a sword. It's not the gun's fault, it's not the sword's fault. If you're not willing to take a sword and cut somebody in half, don't carry a sword. Just the truth of the matter. If you have to decide, it's an intensely personal decision because it has huge consequences either direction. Are you truly willing to use it? And are you truly willing to do all of the due diligence that comes with that? If the answer to both of those is yes, I beg you to carry a gun. We need you out there. If the answer to that is no, to either side of that equation, don't. Don't. You're a greater liability to yourself and your family than if you were not carrying. But is it part of that duty of uh, putting a certain number of rounds through that gun? Absolutely. Week? Absolutely. 250 rounds or what do you? It, it's, there's no number because it depends on your, your, your true proficiency and your true competence. Right, so if you're carrying a gun, you need to be practicing. Often. Yes, without a doubt. Absolutely, without a doubt. Duty. Yes. And, and you need to have these conversations that we're having in this room with yourself and your family. And the hardest part for most people is the honest self-assessment. In my opinion, again, my opinion. Because if you if you take the honest self that really, really dive into who I am and my character, and you answer that yes, under the right circumstances, I'm willing to do this, then you're going to do all the other stuff. Because then you're going to recognize how important that that decision was. And you're going to do the training. And you're going to do the practice, and you're going to understand the law at least enough to be functional. It's that they don't cross the first bridge. I can, so I do, and that's unfortunate um, because ultimately, we all this is always cyclical. We look at our whole society and see this may not be in our lifetimes, but it is cyclical. Ultimately, the people who make the bad decisions restrict the rights of the people who make the good decisions. Eventually, those good people get their rights back. The people make bad decisions, and they get them taken away. So it's cyclical throughout all human nature, throughout all human society. This happens. Is that the reason I woke up this morning and listened to the mayor of New York City say uh, it, it was a shooting room, uh, at, at, in, and the fellow had a high capacity pistol, I think he had 40 rounds capable on that pistol. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, he, he was saying, well, we need to get all these guns on the street. With my seven-round pistol, 
be one of the ones he's talking about when he says get all these guns. You talk about the mayor of New York, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that you're not going to see a lot of that in Texas. I mean, I'm not going to get too much further into that, particularly because we're going to be real political real quick. No, um, I don't mean to put you on the No, 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 no. I, I love these conversations. I really do. And I, I, I'm sure at some point I already have or will say something that somebody's going to be used against me later. Um, are you concerned about the capacity of some of these weapons? No, no, you, you don't care. No, as law enforcement, I do not. People's behavior kills me, not the tool they chose to use. We just had a DPS officer killed on a motorcycle and hit in an accident. That car is way more deadly than that gun. It, it, it's a behavior issue. Uh, we can't make stuff illegal. We do. It doesn't work. Ever. Behavior. If we focused on behavior, we would have a much better outcome than if we focused on stuff. Because really, even those, this is none of this is exclusive, there's always the outliers. Even those people who I know personally that I've talked with who are wholly and completely anti gun believe in all manner of gun control. Those people honestly don't believe that the gun control is going to change anything. But it feels like we're doing something. Because it won't. That's just the reality of it. If they turn, if the federal government said today that every firearm in the United States is illegal right now, it would change nothing. Because nobody has any idea how many there are. There's, I don't remember the last number, but it's somewhere around five firearms for every person in the United States was the last number I saw. Doesn't mean that every person in the United States owns five firearms. It means that my 35. <laughs> Count for a whole lot of other people. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, it's, it's physically impossible to ban firearms in the United States. It cannot happen. It will not happen. I don't care if you put the law in effect right now and looked at it 100 years from now. It will not change. It. What we will end up as is Somalia, and you'll have people importing illegal firearms that weren't on our streets previously into the United States that will be on our streets. Because honestly, like fully automatic machine guns, people talk about them all the time. I've seen like four in my whole life. One of them was mine. If it wasn't made after 1986, it's illegal to possess in the United States unless you're a police officer. And the number of those is very finite. And they cost ridiculous amounts of money. What was a $200 sub machine gun is now a $12,000 sub machine gun. And most people don't have the resources to buy that. If you encounter a fully automatic weapon on the streets of the United States, I will categorically bet a paycheck it was imported illegally to the arms trade. It had nothing to do with our laws. It was in violation of our laws the moment it entered our country. Gun laws don't stop that. In this scenario, mm -hmm. he's at the gas pump, here comes a gentleman, same one gentleman. Would he have had, I mean, you scuffled with him. Would yeah. he have had the right, you know, would he have been justified in, if he had had a weapon, use his force? Just by them. The number of assailants is specifically something that will come up in conversation. If I'm attacked by more than one person, that obviously increases the danger that I'm exposed to. But ultimately, you don't have to answer this, but I want you to answer it to yourself. At any point in time, did you think they were going to kill you? No, you don't have to answer it to us. I want you to think about it in your head because that is the answer. So that's that. So they And I don't, please don't get in that position. Don't get to that point. Because one punch is all it takes. I don't care how big you are, how small they are, it doesn't matter. One punch puts you to sleep and the rest of the world is theirs. They can do what they want. Don't get hurt to create justification. Right before you go to draw your weapon, be able to say, I'm here with my life. Whatever that is, that is whatever. I'm sure. here when he walked up on me. Right. You know, that's my. my right. So it's. That's why you're doing the TikTok. So yes. Yep. There you go. Okay. You know? This is all that due diligence that we're talking about, about the choice whether or not That's I should care. I don't care. Is that consultation? the door out the door to beat the hand and all that stuff? Yeah, I'm actually, I'm testing this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I'm trying to think of all that, you know, again, I think I would immediately. I don't know. Sure. I felt if all that had jumped on me just to get off the truck was full, I knew this would be a bad scenario. So when I did leave, I was literally going to be two miles and then that, all that adrenaline kicked in like crazy mad. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, some 
then that would really be in trouble with my hands on Sure. Right? That's why you train so that you are so right good at pulling that gun out of its holster and putting it where it needs to be that you don't have to think about that part. Okay. So what you're thinking about is what's coming at me. So there's three components. What we call a technical skill. So the technical skill is my ability to operate the weapon system. The bells, the whistles, the buttons, pressing the trigger, lining up the sights, putting the bullet where it needs to go. Can I load it? Can I unload it? Can I keep the muzzle in the safe direction? Can I make the round strike where it needs to go? That's what we would call a technical skill. It's a lot of work. Especially with our handguns, because they're inherently hard to shoot for most people. And that requires practice too. Huge amounts, mm -hmm. huge amounts. Like the best in the business. So pick whatever group you know of, whether it's the Seagull or the Delta or whatever. You pick that group. About 75% of their training is dry fire, not discharging any live fire. They're going through the mechanics, trying to create that muscle memory as you describe. That's just one, that's the first aspect. Second aspect is the tactical side. Have I gone to the courses and taken the training from the people who know to put this technical skill in the environment in which it's expected to be used and now working through all of those problems? And then the third is your own psychological preparation. The third is probably the most key component out of that because it's the thing that leads you to the decision to whether or not I have to employ the tactical and technical skills. That's the one where most people spend the least amount of time. So my recommendation, and I do this with police officers all the time, is you develop what I call, and this, this is a little a mental Rolodex. <laughs> because what happens is when stimulus hits you, you see, you hear, you smell, whatever, your brain starts processing that and tries to make a determination about reaction. It's called the OOLU, if you want to research that. You observe, you orient, you decide, you act. And you're constantly cycling through this loop. So when you observe, you start to orient to that, you're making a decision as to what to do. And then, so the time where we lose, is between the observation and the decision. If we've done the technical and tactical training, the time from the decision to the action is very small. If we haven't done that, then the, design, the time from the decision to the action is very large, and the outcome of the action is very unpredictable because we're doing all the training we're doing, right? Where we lack is in that those two others, the observed orientation to lead to the decision. So if I don't have that mental Rolodex, I have all the stimulus that comes in that my body's probably never observed before. So it's bouncing around all those neurons and they're trying to find an answer. I didn't prepare for it. I didn't train for it. So as what I do as an example of police officers, try to put it in some context. You patrol the same streets, the city and I go just every single day. There's probably one or two or three convenience stores that always give you a free thing that has a nice person behind the counter that you like to go in and talk to. You go to that same convenience store probably at least once every single day that you work. And I ask them this, where do you park? Well, in that same spot. Why? I don't know. Well, probably because it was the, the spot that was closest to the door, because you're lazy, just like everybody else. <laughs> I want to walk the shortest amount of distance as humanly possible to get my 77 ounce sugar drink. Okay. Have my conversation, get back in my car. Stop. Stop. Park as far away as you can. So I take the store that's right in front of the north, right down the corner north of Maine, right? I can enter that store from three different directions. I can come from North Street into the store. I can come from Main Street into the store, or I can park in the business behind it and walk up. Do it differently every time. Every single time, stop, look, and listen. What's going on around you? Probably nothing. <laughs> Probably nothing at all, nefarious, but you're learning. You're learning to see what's important, when it's important to see it. This is mental training. Now, as I do those, what happens if I pull in from the North Street side and I see a fight at the gas pump? What happens if I pull in from the North Street side and I see a fight over on the West Main side by access to the courthouse? What happens if I pull up on the North Street side and I happen to see somebody holding a gun to the cashier? Now replay all those scenarios if I pull up from the West Main side. Replay all the scenarios if I park behind the business and approach on foot. Now, I'm going to run through thousands of scenarios based on that one business as I patrol it as a police officer in that direction, if I'm doing it right. The chances of me seeing the exact scenario that I played out in my mind is almost zero. But the chances of me seeing something substantially similar is incredibly high. So now I've programmed those neurons in my brain to say, here's the answer. So that time from observe, orient, and decide is diminished rapidly. What also happens is that all of the things that my body goes through in critical stress, whether it be tunnel vision or auditory exclusion, 
all of that stuff is also diminished because the panic that I would normally experience isn't there. My mind had saw this stuff and knew where to go and find an answer. So there's no panic. There's no panic. I just took the few variables that were different, plugged those into the equation and got an answer. So that's really where all of that comes into is that mental preparation for dealing with all these issues. How many of y'all shop at Walmart? Have you ever shopped at Walmart? Show you park as close as you can in front of the store. I don't. I park way out on the outside. As I walk up, every person that walks by me and assess their demeanor, I look at their hands. Not because I think any of them mean me harm. None of them do. They're not doing it. Maybe it's the fact that I exist. The reason I do it is because it trains me to see what's important. And that's it. When I was a police officer really working the streets, I would leave a traffic stop and Andrew Jones would say, hey, we're looking for this guy. He shows me a picture. Is this him? I go, I don't know. He go, you're an idiot. You just talked to him. Like for <laughs> five minutes, you stood there talking to this guy. You don't know what he looks like? Nope. Why not? Because he can't kill me with his head. I just didn't care. I was too busy looking at all of the other things that were important. What's in the cubbies of his car? Where are his hands? What's his heart rate look like? I'm looking at the vein inside of his neck. He's pounding because he's really nervous. Is there a gun in the back seat? Is there dope in the car? Whatever. That's important information. Staring at the guy's face because it's pretty or ugly. Didn't make any difference. So when, when I walk that path at Walmart, I don't know this is my family. If I'm walking up, again, it could be a 65-year-old woman that's just paying no attention to me, but I can't see her right hand. Is she going to hurt me? No. But I can't see her right hand. I'm not planning for the 65 year old woman. I'm planning for the guy who just robbed the Walmart is trying to get to his car. He <laughs> to see me. And if you're in the criminal element, it doesn't matter what I'm wearing. What do I look like? <laughs> I look like the <laughs> I could work undercover if I want. So I see that exact same scenario. It doesn't matter who the person is. I can't see their right hand. So I'm going to cover. I just slowly drift over behind them. Watching, they look at me, hey, how are you doing? Keep moving along. So I'm training my body to react to the stimulus. What would I do if they did pull a gun? I'm standing between all these cars in the middle of this aisle. It's a horrible place to be. I'm going to slow and drift. Again, all of that is psychological preparation. Heaven forbid the day come that I have to deploy it. But it's just the preparation that I do. That's the due diligence. If human life is meaningful to you, and you choose to carry a method with you every single day that has no other purpose on this planet than to take it, those are all your responsibilities. All of that. The technical, the tactical, and the mental preparation, the psychological. You're speaking of um, the uh, due diligence, I back to business and business and if a business owner is good with their employees carrying a firearm, it seems to me that that business owner would want to make sure that they're they get regular training that they're that would be the, the that's what I would do. absolutely uh, there's plenty of people that can do it there's plenty of resources in our own community that are some of them are very very good at it uh, I've, I've worked with lots of businesses I've worked with lots of school districts um, even well outside of the state of Texas which let's make it just on the, in the private sector doing exactly that. Um, if I owned a business and I was going to, even if I was going to be the only one carrying and I was there all the time, I would give my employees training. Because, Regular, though. Yeah. Ongoing. Yeah, it's not like a one and done. Right. Because unless people actually start thinking about this stuff, you can talk about it all you want. It doesn't matter. It's stuff in one ear, not the other. It's a checkbox because I had to do because I worked there. And, and I hear you, Lieutenant Kennedy, but it's like the vaccination situation. <laughs> You're going to have some employees that will embrace the concept of being vaccinated. And some that won't, and will be the same in terms of concealed carry. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, that you're going to have conformists and nonconformists. And I'm not, I, I'm not denigrating either one of them. Sure. It's their right. My wife, as an example, I think it would be a hard sell sure. to convince her to carry a pistol. Wayne is is idiotic enough to probably <laughs> want it. And I don't mean that in the no, sense. No, I mean, I agree. I, I, as recently as yesterday, I had somebody of an authority of Echidocious tell me in a meeting, our biggest problem at the jail today are people that shouldn't be there because they have mental, they have issues of mental capacity. Sure. And not necessarily, they're not necessarily natural criminals, they're people that need help. Sure. 
but there's no other place for them to go, so they're incarcerated, waiting a trial or, or, or convicted. And that's a woman or a man that ought not to probably have a gun or, or be able to purchase. Right. I mean, I've got, I've got, look, I love my relatives, but there's a couple of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, I don't mean that, but I agree. Really, <laughs> and that just compounds your problem as a law enforcement and my problem as, a, as, as an administrator, because I don't know what walks in that front door. And we do have, we do have protocols, and we're pretty good at it. But that still doesn't mean that Barbara's not going to end up wrestling with somebody <laughs> on that floor there. So, and I don't mean that. I mean, I, God forbid. But we're all in the same business too. It's the unfortunate reality of the world that we live in. And, and a lot of it has to do with mental health. Mental health is a very and, big problem. Uh, and I'll, I'll say this: this is going to be horribly unpopular. But I think the, the concept of deinstitutionalization was was a horrible idea because we push folks on the street and have, don't really take care of themselves and they're attacked by others. <laughs> Without broaching into Bill Kennedy's personal opinion on that. <laughs> Here's what I will tell you is that we do have an incredible mental health issue in the state of Texas. Uh, there is a much bigger push since we're talking about legislation. There's lots and lots of legislation that's been pushed out to push to get the mental health out of the jail system out of the prison systems. But as is right now, we don't have enough resources. You're absolutely right, and there's not another place that can deal with the volume. Um, we're too far gone. It's been too long since we put the appropriate resources into true mental health. And this is gonna be why we're popular. And by the way, it's not exclusive to Texas. No, 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 no. I left Maine. Maine not my situation. Maine situation is even more unacceptable than Texas. Sure. They close mental health facilities all over the place. And said, well, you know, we'll medicate them on the streets. And the truth of that is that you, that they routinely freeze to death on the streets mm -hmm. of Maine. And that's tragic, in my opinion. Right. And, and unacceptable. Uh, so, oh, that's a, that's, a, that's a personal opinion. It is in the chambers below. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's, it, it is, it's, it's interesting because it is part of this conversation. Because a person's mental status has a great impact on what they are and willing to do. So in Texas, what does it mean to be criminally insane? Anybody know? somebody's out to get you and nobody's out to get you, uh, but that you engage in criminal conduct, uh, criminally insane to its two parts. Yes, you are insane, but that you're insane to such a degree that you're unable to appreciate the nature of the conduct that you're engaged in. Um, and, and there are plenty of insane people that still understand that what they're doing is wrong. Um, and so it's, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult just from a prosecution perspective, let alone a law enforcement perspective on the street, trying to deal with that is, is a major issue. Um, uh, and I, you know, we probably would go down that mental health uh, road for, for a while, but, but you know, in the context of firearms, uh, it's, a scary, it's a scary premise because if you've got, I mean, if you've got a substantial portion of the population who are out on the streets because they aren't uh, in, a, in, a, in a mental health facility getting the, the, the treatment that they need, uh, and the jail's busted at the seams, and that person's got a firearm, but you will know that they've got a mental health issue, uh, that's, that's, a scary, that's a scary reality, right? So if you follow the logic, it has a big influence on your ability to, to use force, again, based on what you know at the time. The dangerous part of that is, and I am not uncompassionate to the mentally ill by any stretch of the imagination, but here's the, the core reality, is if someone is criminally insane, here's the gist of it. They don't know the difference between right and wrong, at least at the moment that they did what they did. Imagine you, or anybody you know, that can't honestly tell the difference between right and wrong. They don't have that barrier that requires a conscious decision to do this thing that hurts that person. 
for each and every one of us would probably have some, call it whatever you want to, conscience or soul or guardian angel, whatever it is you want to call it, even if you don't believe in God. We have this barrier that we have to psychologically intentionally cross to harm another human being. By definition, at least at the moment that the crime was committed, that they did what they did, that barrier didn't exist. Now, do you think that person is more dangerous or less dangerous? What do you think? They're more dangerous. That's the cruel reality of it. They are more dangerous. It doesn't mean that they need to be in prison for the rest of life. It means that that's just the way it is. Again, I'm not, I'm not compassionate to the mentally ill, especially those that are that far from the mentally ill. That is an extreme, extreme circumstance. And it's not just confined to the mentally ill. I can think back to my first chamber job. We have festival, very similar to the Blueberry Festival. And the young fellow who was probably in his, in his late 40s, whose name I won't give you, but he, he probably had a mental capacity of 10 to 12 years of age. And we gave him the job of security, watching a tent overnight so people wouldn't steal the trinkets inside the tent. And, exactly. and a week later, I get a call from the chief of police screaming at me on the phone and saying, Jack is down here and he wants a gun permit. <laughs> and, and he says, and Wayne, I have no basis to deny him. He's never committed, he's never he, he's never committed a crime. He's not on anybody's radar, but he's 10 years old psychologically. What am I gonna do here? You know, and I had to get out and talk to him. Jack, I would be careful. And, and talk him out of the I said, we won't use you if you have a gun. And the only reason he stopped is he wanted to be part of that festival so much. Right. But um, if he had elected to get that gun, my chief of police turned to me and he said, wait, I'd have to give him a permit. There's no basis for me to deny it. So that, from a legal perspective, if you are adjudicated mentally ill, you are federally prohibited from possessing a firearm. So therefore, you're also by state law prohibited from possessing a firearm. But the, but is he mentally Ill? the key phrase is adjudicated which means you have to have gone before a court and that court must have a judgment that says you are mentally ill, which is not common. Um, and interestingly enough, there's no database that tells me if I run Andrew Jones that he was adjudicated mentally ill. <laughs> 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 So I know we've gone way past our time. And again, I will stay as long as y'all want to talk about these topics. But I have a couple of questions I want to get to the group before people need to start heading out the door. The first one is, is there's a, a program through the state of Texas that always has been. It's a two-year certification called Crime Prevention Officer. Uh, if we send officers to that, it's a pretty intensive course. But the, the goal is, is that those officers can now go to businesses and do things like, hey, we need to put cameras here. We need to cut these shrubs. We need to add shrubs here. It's a general security survey. Um, to just generally talk about business security. There are those of us that can certainly do it, we just don't carry that certification. Uh, so if you get those services from us now, I do, like I'll do, I've done all four travel, I've done most of the bigger industries where I go through and talk to them about active shooting issues. Um, but if you want the more in depth, I'm just interested to, for you to talk to other members of the chamber and find out how much interest there would be in such a program. It would take a little bit of investment on the police department's part, but if the interest is high enough uh, I'll propose it and see if we have some people who are interested in going to that and getting the certification. So just kind of bounce that around and call me or email me with some information. And then the other is, since I have you here and we're having these open and honest conversations, I want to know from you, if you're willing to tell me, it doesn't have to be right now, it can be out there. I want to know what you think about this. I want to know what your honest, no kidding opinion is about your Nacogdoches Police Department. Can I please that my Sure. Uh, in March 2020, I had just graduated. I was in, I hadn't graduated yet from the Citizens Police Academy, awesome program. But I got to go on a ride along during the <laughs> spring break that week, one night, and it was an eye opener. I was with this little 25 year old officer <laughs> and it was a ton of fun it was also scary but it opened my eyes as to what the police face day in and day out 
And um, my understanding is any citizen can do that. Yes. Uh, so if you're not a member of the Citizens Police Academy or um, leader, leadership, leadership. leadership. Yeah. Yeah. those have a built in ride along program within the program itself, but other people can contact the chief of police or assistant chief in Terra Bella Hill Patrol, and he can schedule ride alongs for people. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we hugely encourage those two programs. Um, we also encourage the ride alongs. There has to be some temperance to it, though, because obviously there's a great liability that comes to citizens riding out with us. We want you out there. We want you to see what we do. Uh, we just couldn't have somebody in the car with us every day, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those cars are already two-man units because we have so many people going through training because law enforcement right now is a very open, revolving door. So a lot of people are coming in and getting out. And it's just the kind of the nature of the beast right now. But I'm very interested in those honest critiques. Because I want to know. And, and, and the thought occurred to me, I said, yeah, this constituency here could give you a very different reaction than another part of our community. I mean, with the <coughs> Hispanic part, the African American. I mean, it'd be interesting to find out the different perceptions of this, just like we do with the chamber. Sure. I want to know how people feel about what we're doing. Um, yep. I mean, there'll be some folks that could say to us, you guys don't need to be messing around with concealed carry. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a enforcement issue, not a chamber. So sure. sure as hell is, right? Uh, it's like human trafficking is another. But I, it, at some point, I'd love to have this type of discussion. They just did a human trafficking presentation on the weekend. Mm -hmm. the so, yeah. See, and that, but, but we're not immune to the impacts of that as well. Well, and ultimately, Regardless of where you sit on any side of any conversation, talking about it is all we good. And that's all we're doing today. We're just talking about it. I hope that my presentation to you has come across as more neutral than anything else, because that's just kind of the way I, I am. The, it, what is, is. We can't undo that. Whether we were talking about the mental health issues or the gun laws as they are, those are the realities of the world that we live in. If we choose not to talk about them because we don't like them, it doesn't make them any less real. But that seems to be how we deal with things more commonly in our communities now. Is just let's forget that problem exists and maybe it'll go away on its own. That leads to the opposite. That problem just blossoms and gets bigger. So that problem is so big that it's affecting enough people that people finally want to talk about it. I'm okay with the uncomfortable conversations. I'll have them. And if people get mad at me for it, they just kind of get mad at me. You know? Because we got to talk about this stuff. It's not going to get better. I will say, from my standpoint, I'm in your it. Police department has been fantastic to us. I mean, we have panic buttons at the governor's desk and at the front if we had anything. Sometimes those get pushed. You know, the doctor tries to open the door and he mashes that until the police come. You know, <laughs> sorry, or we'll call. But, uh, you know, at night especially, we do have one of our short works with the police department. And uh, they'll, just, they'll just make a drive by. Or they'll, you know, if I ask them to, they'll just come by or. You know, I've not had anything but positive uh, from them, so. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, part of my job in, in all of the stuff that Mary's not supposed to read about me, uh, I am the, it's, put whatever title you want on it, I'm the head of our professional standards division, which most people call it Child Affairs. So if you file a complaint against the police department and it's substantial enough that we need to, some of them are investigated by the line level supervisors, like I'm professionals. Anything significant comes to me. Uh, they, they call me the director or whatever. It, it's just me. It, it's not like I got a unit for me. I have a sergeant that helps me when I need it. Um, but I only tell you that because I want to know legitimately not only your opinion about us, but if you have an encounter that you don't think went the way it should have gone, or if you hear of one, and it's that second one that seems to be bothering us the most, whether it's on Macado Just Tall or whatever. We say a bunch of stuff, but we don't say any of it to the right people. And then we never get to the bottom of what actually happened. And ultimately, the police department never has a place, and it's really inappropriate for us to argue that publicly. We can't turn around and get on that and just talk about, well, Sally, what you said didn't happen. Here's what actually happened. That, that takes away our neutrality, uh, but you're our voice. So if, if we're doing it right and you know it, tell people. If we're doing it wrong and you know it, tell me and then tell people. I don't care if you tell people because, again, what is is, but tell me so I can, one, 
look into it and determine whether or not we actually did it right or wrong. And if we did it wrong, I'll be the first to tell you we did. But if it just needs a little bit of sitting down and talking about it and explaining what actually happened and why, then we're all better off for it. We, we all got educated. I learned that the public perceives a certain thing a certain way. And somebody in the public learned that this is why that happened. It's the dialogue that we're missing. There's, and you're never going to have it in the court of public opinion. I recognize that's just the reality in which we live. Everybody gets trying to court public opinion. It doesn't matter if you're innocent, innocent whatever gets said gets said. So we can't really fight that other than with a better public opinion. The naysayers will always be. But I don't want people thinking, I see it all the time on the Mecca just talk, it drives me crazy. Uh, stories about some kind of law enforcement encounter that gives me enough information that I can look into it. And I'm like, that's just not true. It's categorically not true. Whether it's a blatant lie or just a misinterpretation of information, it's just not true. And I'd love for us to have a dialogue about all of that stuff because ultimately it means we do a better job and everyone has a better understanding of that job. It works better for everyone. So please take my card, honest conversation, critique us. Tell us what you don't like. We're thick skinned, we can So I can say since I had reasons with Nacogdoches Police Department since um 92 as a property owner um the department has become extremely more professional um i guess i'd say user friendly in other you know in other words <laughs> interactive sure. i have less reason mm -hmm. to deal with the officers uh now than i did when i had 56 units versus two so there's that. But in that respect, all of my members, I hear much less negative now than I used to. So thank you, well, all of you. I certainly can't take credit for it, but I'll pass it on to well, you. Well, you all, yes. Uh, so I don't, again, I'll stay here as long as anybody wants to stay and talk. Feel free to get up and leave at your leisure. I, I'm not going to be mad at you. Uh, Sorry, Kenny, well, I said, thank you. For, I, yes. I apologize again for having to do that conference call. I want to thank you as well. Thank you.